So I'm Rose Eveleth. I'm the host of Flash Forward, which is a podcast about the future. But more importantly, um, I am a very huge fan of mustard. <laughs> and you and I were actually talking about this, I don't know, a year or two ago. And you were like, you have to do an episode on mustard. Yeah. So why are you obsessed with mustard? So I, it's funny, in, in thinking about this call that we were going to have, I, I figured you would ask me that question. And I realized that I don't have a great answer. I mean, it is objectively the best condiment, um, but that's not the best answer. I mean, it's just really delicious. It goes on everything. But I, I wanted you all to do an episode on it because I am a fan of mustard and I consume a very large quantity of mustard, probably an embarrassing amount of mustard. But I don't actually know that much about how mustard is made. Like, I'm familiar that there is a mustard plant and a mustard seed, but what actually makes different mustards different is actually sort of a mystery to me. I just eat them. I don't know that much about them. That's what we're here for is to do the Googling you can't yes. be bothered to do. <laughs> exactly. I'm too lazy. I need an episode of Gastropod. Fortunately, Cynthia and I are not lazy at all, ever, in any way. I hope everyone believes you. And so Rose's wish was our command. I'm Nicola Twilley. And I'm Cynthia Graber. And as Rose pointed out, this is indeed an episode of Gastropod, the podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. We are happy to look into mustard, but Rose, in return, you have to answer all my questions about what life might be like in the future. But first, mustard. What do you want to know? I guess, you know, I eat a lot of mustard and I know a lot about the different kinds of mustard that I could purchase on the market, right? I know the, you know, various varieties of consumer goods related to mustard. I know a lot about how mustard tastes. I know nothing about the pre going into my mouth parts of mustard. I mean, I get the basics. There is a seed, you know, and like it's in many ways, like a lot of other things that are made from seeds. Um, the, the powder seems obvious to me, right? It's like ground up seeds. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Who knows? Um, uh, you know, actually. Side note, which we didn't say because we didn't want to puncture Rose's belief in all things gastropod, but we didn't actually know. Then, now we do. But before we share our newfound mustard knowledge, we want to tell you about a couple of sponsors this episode. Bob's Red Mill is an employee-owned company that has been offering organic, gluten-free, and stone-ground products for decades. With Bob's Red Mill, you're not just getting quality, you're getting flavor-packed, healthy food that actually tastes amazing. Visit bobsredmill.com today. Bob's Red Mill, good food for all. Where is your next meal coming from? Try Caviar. Caviar brings you food from all the best local restaurants. Order on the Caviar app or online at trycaviar.com and get the food you crave from pizza and Chinese to Indian sushi and barbecue delivered. Order today and pay no delivery fee on your first order. Plus, take $10 off your first order of $30 or more with code GASTROPOD. Offer valid until March 31st. Finally, I want to let you know about another show we enjoy called 20,000 Hertz. In each episode, host Dallas Taylor tells stories about the things we hear but don't think much about. They've done stories about music, the NBC chimes, the sounds on your computers and phones, as well as familiar sound effects in movies that you've heard a million times but have probably never thought about. It's highly produced and weaves sound and storytelling together in a powerful way. Subscribe to 20,000 Hertz, all spelled out, in your favorite podcast player. Rose has been a mustard fan for a long time. I used to be an athlete in like high school. And so I was constantly at various athletic events and they often would sell pretzels and hot dogs and stuff like that. And I think that was when I realized that mustard is far superior to ketchup. Um, and so I was always really into mustard. But I don't actually know that much about like what the process is to take a mustard plant and if there are like multiple different kinds of mustard plants and then get to these various different kinds of mustards. Like what makes Dijon Dijon? Is it the plant? Is it the seed? Is it the processing? Is it some combination of all of those things? And so I was just curious about where mustard comes from and sort of how all of these different types of mustard are made. So many questions, so many answers. But let's start by getting our basics down. What exactly is this mustard plant of which Rose speaks? The mustard family it actually consists of about 3,600 different species. And so there, there's quite a bit of diversity. Most of those species are the types that you would see growing in the cracks of sidewalks. Patrick Edger is assistant professor of horticulture at Michigan State University. The mustard family really consists of, you know, lots of wild species, but most notably the majority of the vegetable crops that you probably eat and consume every day. You know, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, radishes, 
as well as like wasabi as a condiment or mustard as a condiment. But in addition, there's a lot of oil seed types. So we would have things such as like rapeseed or canola oil that we would cook with. Those are all from the very same family. Fortunately, for the sake of my sanity, the kind of mustard that we can buy at the store labeled as mustard only comes from three plants within this enormous family. Black mustard, brown mustard, and white mustard. Confusingly, the white seeds make yellow mustard and the brown seeds are kind of beige yellow inside, so the whole color terminology is not particularly helpful. But all three kinds of mustard seed have one thing in common. They're tiny. And this is just the point of another mustard story Rose told us. Yeah. So my um, grandparents on my mom's side are Catholic. And um, when I was a kid, my grandma gave me this uh, charm bracelet. And it had all sorts of various Catholic charms on it. It had obviously a little cross, but it also had a bunch of other little charms that were relevant to various parts of the Bible or stories or whatever it was. And I was a very like tomboy kind of kid. So I was like, I'm not going to wear jewelry. This is stupid. But there was one charm on the bracelet that I was really into because it was this tiny little um, magnifying glass that you could flip open and you could look into it and it just magnified one mustard seed. And I guess this comes from a parable of the mustard seed in the Bible. I had never heard of this parable of the mustard seed before, probably because I'm not too familiar with the New Testament. Whereas I had, despite never consciously listening in church at school. The text this morning is from Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Yeah, so I should say that I'm not a scholar of the Bible, and that, nor am I a believer. So, like, I, I'm not an expert here, but... It's basically about how the mustard plant is really large. The mustard plant can get to be nine feet tall. And for a plant that big, they have small seeds. And so the story, the parable in the Bible is kind of about that size difference, that when that tiny, tiny seed is planted in the earth, it makes a giant plant. It's kind of one of those don't judge a book by its cover, I think, ideas that even though the seed is so small, um, it can become this great, huge, beautiful thing with birds and, you know, branches and all this stuff. So that's kind of, I think, what the parable is about if I am interpreting it correctly, which I could be not doing. I am not a believer or a biblical scholar either, but from the best I can tell, this mustard seed story is actually more about how the kingdom of God will grow from its tiny beginnings. Which I still don't really get, but that's fine. It's not meant for me. But this Jesus connection has an interesting side note attached to it. Supposedly because Christians were so attached to their mustard seeds, they carried them with them and scattered them as they walked, and so mustard plants grew along their trails. One of the places you hear about this happening is in California. People say that one of the early missionaries, Junipero Serra, walked north from the San Diego mission in the 1700s, scattering mustard seeds as he went. And the resulting, quote, Bible trail is apparently still marked by mustard plants today. People say the same thing about pilgrim routes on the east coast of the U.S. too. You're supposed to be able to see them clearly from above thanks to their bright yellow flowers. There's a gastropod fan and supporter who also happens to, okay, be a friend of yours, Nikki. And he also happens to work for a company that specializes in satellite mapping. So we figured maybe he'd know if the supposed mustard trail is indeed visible from space. Do the satellite images show the particular visible signature of mustard? So my friend Wayne does actually have a real job, so he couldn't devote too much time to the search. But he told us that unfortunately most purchasers of satellite imagery actually want something called leaf off images. These are images captured in the winter when there isn't a ton of foliage covering up all the other features they're interested in. So long story short, no luck. If anyone knows whether this California mustard trail tale has been proven true or false, please get in touch. But Rose doesn't love mustard for its religious connections. She loves it because of its heat, its pungency and flavor. That sharp, pungent, bitter flavor that we sense are from compounds called glucosinolates. Uh, there are roughly 120 some different compounds. And depending on the abundance and the profile of like the composition of these various compounds, that's what gives the cruciferous vegetables 
that sort of flavor. Now, remember, these cruciferous vegetables, there are a lot of them. Kale and Brussels sprouts and broccoli, just to name a few of my favorites. They have some of these glucosinolates, maybe slightly different ones with slightly different flavors. But things like kale and cabbage don't have nearly as much pungency as mustard does. In other words, there's a whole spectrum of spiciness between species, depending on which and how much of these 120 different glucosinolates they have. But here's a question. What purpose does this pungency have for the plant? Yeah, so like most organisms, plants do not want to be predated on. They don't want to be consumed. And being a plant, when you're fixed in a location and you're constantly combating insects and fungal pathogens and bacteria and viruses, you have to have some way to defend yourself. And so most of the flavors or things that we describe as flavors are actually chemical compounds that plants use to ward off being predated upon. And glucosinolates are one of those examples. Unsurprisingly, there's an evolutionary reason for why the seeds of a mustard plant, the part we use for making the condiment, are much spicier than its leaves, which we use in a salad. If the purpose of a plant is to pass on the genetic material, they will invest quite a bit of that uh, into their seeds to protect actually the, that next generation. So in mustard seeds, there's lots of glucosinolates. These glucosinolates are really poisonous to some species. They kill insects. Glucosinolates are actually incredibly toxic even to the plant. Uh, the plants will actually sequester a lot of the precursor molecules and vacuoles that, that safeguard it even from the cell. So that's how toxic they are. Those special containers get broken open when an insect starts chomping. But here's where these mustard toxins get even more interesting. A couple years ago, Patrick published a paper tracing what he calls the Great Butterfly Mustard Arms Race. The story starts 90 million years ago when the first mustard plant ancestors figured out how to stop caterpillars from eating them by producing some glucosinolates. When the compounds first evolved, uh, it would have been a, an instant barrier for predation, right? And so that actually would have permitted that ancestral plant that just evolved this novel trait to diversify uh, very rapidly across the landscape. Because now it basically has a, a wonderful sort of set of armor, right, for any predation to occur. So now the mustard great, 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 etc. grandparent is super chill. The caterpillar can't eat it. It's free to grow and spread across the landscape for at least a few million years. But the caterpillars aren't done. They are hungry, hungry caterpillars. So the insects evolved a enzyme, a novel enzyme, a brand new gene that actually, as the insect is consuming these glucosinolates, actually cleaves the compounds, this chemical compound, to make it an inert structure. So now these glucosinolates are no longer toxic to the caterpillars, and now the caterpillars are the happy ones. We then see, as one would predict, it now has a, a buffet. They can eat as much as they want of the spicy plant that no other insect can snack on. And now it's the caterpillar's turn to spread and diversify and generally be boss. But as you would expect, the mustard plant ancestor does not take this lying down. Like Patrick said, it's an arms race. We actually see repeated cycles of this, minimally three of them, that have occurred over the last 90 million years. This is plant-animal warfare, people. For his experiment, Patrick and his colleagues studied hundreds of species of related plants, plants that trace their ancestry back to those original millions of years ago genetic splits. This way they could figure out the timeline of when each side temporarily was victorious. They could see these big leaps forward in mustard defenses written in the plant's DNA. One thing to note, lots of plants pass multiple copies of their genomes down to their offspring, instead of the single copies that we humans pass on to our kids. And this extra genetic material gives the mustard plant so many options to play with, so many different pathways to make new, improved glucosinolates. After every set of duplications, you basically would have a new and fancier set of, of defenses. And this escalated over time until the present day, where many of the mustard plants have 
you know, over 100 compounds in them. Here's one of my favorite points in this whole research. This arms race led to amazing success for both insects and plants. As the war went on, it actually created many, many new species of both brassica and butterflies, both dramatically increased in biodiversity and habitat. It is at least partly due to this arms race that we have kale and collards and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and horseradish and mustard and radishes and everything. As the brassicaceae were more successful, that actually permitted subsequently the butterflies to be more successful, but then they also, each of them, have shaped the underlying genomes or the or even the phenotypes of one another. Ultimately, we really have the butterflies to thank for mustards, right? Mustard compounds. None of this would have existed if it wasn't for this arms race. Next time you squirt mustard on the hot dog, remember to thank a caterpillar. So... That's cool, but my favorite part of Patrick's experiment is that as part of his whole process, he found plants that are living today that have the level of glucosinolates that mustard used to have in the past. There are actually relatives from those ancestral intermediates that you can go out and you could potentially sample. And that was part of the study. We found all these sort of intermediate lineages, remnants. And and from that, we can actually make estimates of what those profiles probably were like. We can't be definitive about it, but we can make really pretty solid estimates of uh, what what those ancestral states would have been like, going back to at least 90 million years. I temporarily lost my mind for a minute when I heard this and decided that what Cynthia and I needed to do was track down all these milder tasting relatives and do a mustard tasting through evolution from bland to fiery. That sounds awesome, of course, but then you realize that it's just the two of us and we have to put out shows and that would take months of plant collection and seed crushing. But if some millionaire mustardophile out there would like to fund this quest, I am available to talk offline. The 90 million year mustard tasting awaits. And I will happily join in. So Patrick and his colleagues wrote about this butterfly mustard arms race. But here's something that might scare you. The battle is not yet over. We see this constantly happening. So a lot of cabbage butterflies, if you grow any cruciferous vegetables in your backyard, broccoli or cabbages or uh, cauliflower or what have it, Uh, you'll see lots of cabbage butterflies always trying to predate on it. And that means that the plants need to be upping their game. And they will. I could imagine uh, a mustard being spicier. Not just spicier, but even with slightly different flavor profiles from new variations and combinations of these glucosinolates. Basically, we can't even imagine the mustards of the future. Rose, this is the episode you get to make. Right. You do mustards of the future, we do the mustard science, and next, mustard history. But first, we want to tell you about a couple of our sponsors this episode. Bob's Red Mill have been offering organic, gluten-free, and stone ground products for decades. From oats and grains to flowers and meals, every product is of the highest quality and is minimally processed from their stone mill in Oregon. Bob got inspired in the 1960s after reading John Goff's Mill, a book about an archaeologist who rebuilt a flour mill. He then wrote to 20 companies that made mill equipment before finally tracking down the quartz millstones used in traditional stone grinding in North Carolina. Today, anyone with a gluten allergy or celiac disease will be happy to know that all of Bob's Red Mill's gluten-free products are processed in a 100% gluten-free facility to ensure no cross-contamination. So whether you're gluten-free, vegan, or just want the highest quality products, Bob's Red Mill is your go-to. With Bob's Red Mill, you're not just getting quality, you're getting flavor-packed, healthy food that actually tastes amazing. Head to bobsredmill.com to shop and explore their huge range of products and get inspiration from hundreds of recipes. That's bobsredmill.com. Getting ready to tackle your spring cleaning? This year, use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser to take on the impossible stains your sprays and wipes can't. All you have to do is wet it under the tap, give it a squeeze, and it's ready to erase. And because it cleans with water alone, you don't have to worry about harsh cleaning fumes or scents. Mr. Clean was originally launched in 1958 by Linwood Burton, a marine ship cleaning businessman in partnership with a friend. Before Mr. Clean, ships had to be cleaned using super harsh abrasives and solvents that were dangerous to workers. Burton's innovative new formula made it possible to clean off all that grease and grime safely and effectively. That's why the original model for the Mr. Clean mascot was a U.S. Navy sailor from Pensacola. If you're about to take on your spring cleaning, you should definitely try Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It makes cleaning your toughest kitchen and bathroom messes fast and easy. Check out mrclean.com slash podcast to see more ways the Magic Eraser can help you knock out impossible messes all around the house. At this stage, I would say that these findings are the earliest 
conclusive use of spice for a culinary purpose. Haley Saul is an archaeologist at Western Sydney University. And a few years ago, she and her colleagues discovered the earliest known example of spiced food in human history. Dishes perked up with, yes, mustard. Okay, picture the scene. It's more than 6,000 years ago, and you're in northern Europe eating a plant called garlic mustard. So there were three main sites where we found the evidence of uh, garlic mustard. One of them in Germany, which is a site called Neustadt, um, which is actually now underwater. It's been excavated underwater. That inundation is actually one of the reasons why the pottery and the pottery residues are very well preserved, because the water logging is great for preservation. And the same at the sites in Denmark. So the sites are called Urkonga and Stenu, and they're located on the edge of a bog. There are lots of sites like these found near water because water is a great source of food. But the people who were living at these sites, were they just hunting and gathering all the wild plants and animals that lived in and near the water? Who were these people? So, yeah, all of the sites actually span the sort of Mesolithic Neolithic transition, which is the time at which people were starting to just domesticate and experiment with domesticated plants and animals. So the people that lived kind of in the Mesolithic tend to be associated with hunting and gathering, but it's actually much more complicated than that, really. It wasn't the case that people just gave up on hunted and gathered foods and then adopted these new, more superior types of domesticated foods. They were actually combining things, and it was it was just a, a period, I like to think of it as a period that was very creative, and there were new types of foods coming in, but, but people were starting to sort of explore how they could combine it with foods that they'd used for years. What Haley's saying is surprising to me. I don't tend to think of Mesolithic or Neolithic people as being culinary wizards or experimenting with their food to create new textures and flavors. I think there's been a kind of an assumption in general that in prehistory people were driven by just a need to get a, a certain amount of energy and that there was nothing particularly artistic about food practices in prehistory and in part that's brought about just because of the techniques that we have and the difficulty of finding certain evidence so it's quite easy to document animal bones on a site and slightly more difficult to document plants because they don't preserve very well. In the past, scientists have been able to figure out what people were eating on kind of a more general scale. Did they get more of their calories from protein or from fat? Did they go fishing or were they butchering domesticated cattle? But until recently, it's been much more difficult to get a fine-grained look at the flavors of the foods prehistoric people were cooking. But now there are new techniques that Haley says can give a much higher resolution look at ancient diets. These higher resolution techniques include starch analysis as well as drilling into food residue to analyze the fats. There's also a kind of microscopic analysis to match the tiny fossil remnants of plant cells, which are called phytoliths, to a catalogue of different plant species collected from the area. The combination of all these techniques, plus how well preserved the food residues were at these sites, meant that Haley and her colleagues were able to get that more nuanced and detailed picture of what these early northern Europeans were eating. And there was a lot of food residue for Haley and her colleagues to analyze. In some cases, it was up to a centimetre thick because the pottery wasn't necessarily cleaned. So it was just becoming more and more carbonized and, and thicker and thicker residues. A bit like you would use a skillet. The flavor is partly brought to the food because the skillet is sort of reused again and again and again. And it's only when the carbonization of that residue becomes so kind of distasteful that the pottery is actually thrown away into the lake or into the sea. And at that point, it's just like a record of reuse and reuse and reuse, so a kind of build up of all of these different meals that the pot's been used for. And Haley's big find from this food residue, these Mesolithic people were revving up their stews with a plant called garlic mustard. I know I said this already, but drumroll, this is the earliest known culinary use of a spice in the world. It's from the seed husk, the actual sort of hardened shell of the um, seed, which has a flavor if you grind it up, much like mustard. Haley was able to figure this out by comparing the phytoliths, these plant microfossils, to the microscopic structures you find in garlic mustard today. I had to do a lot of just going out into the um, countryside and foraging for plants that were edible and, and, you know, making up the reference collections and things. And it's one of those plants that it, you could so easily overlook. It's just everywhere. And once you get your eye in, you can see that it's everywhere. And um, I mean, it's 
a, a plant that's available across the whole of Europe, right into sort of India and parts of Asia as well. But it's not just usable for the seeds the leaves of the plant are edible as well. The reason it's called garlic mustard is because the leaves have a very garlicky aroma, but the seeds have a very mustardy flavor. So you can sort of combine your different flavors in one plant, really. That sounds delicious. But we were wondering, maybe garlic mustard was a major source of calories for the folks in these settlements. How can we know it was being used intentionally to flavor their food? The seed itself of of Aliaria petiolata is is very, very small and it's woody. Some people have suggested that it, it um, has properties for preservation and it may have um, medicinal properties but because it's so woody in terms of delivering anything like energy or um, a great deal of um, vitamin nutritional value it doesn't really do that so it it seems to be much more that it's being used at least in part because of its aromatic properties so it's it's imparting flavors into the food. Basically, it turns out that Haley is pretty confident that the Mesolithic people had Rose Eveleth style levels of enthusiasm for mustard. They too thought that there was nothing that didn't taste better with some mustard. We were finding from the lipid residue analyses that they were combining garlic mustard with marine fish. They also made stews of garlic, mustard, and meat from animals they either hunted or raised like cattle or deer. It's such a common spice. It's almost like they're using it as we would use salt and pepper. And that suggests to me that it could have an even longer history, but we just don't know at this stage. And actually, there are even older sites around the Mediterranean that have plant remains from other spices and herbs, poppy, cumin, coriander. But the plant bits are not embedded in cookware, so we can't be positive that people were actually eating these spices. But maybe they were. Really, though, the important question here is, what did these mustard spice dishes taste like? Fortunately... Haley can answer that one too. Because my research involves me sort of going out and foraging for plants for my reference collection, the temptation is always there to sort of try out what the flavors of those different plants were. Yeah, so I have made some unusual concoctions of my own. But if you can find some garlic mustard, just grinding it up in a pestle and mortar, and you can smell the mustardy flavor as you're grinding it as well. And it, it's delicious in a nice you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Haley made her own Mesolithic garlic mustard stew. I used it with some venison. My dad's a butcher, so uh, I managed to get a nice cut of venison. <laughs> and? It did taste quite contemporary. I, it's not such a strong flavor as the sort of mustard that you would get in a pot, but it was definitely a sort of flavor of mustard. I love the idea that the earliest known use of spice involves garlic mustard, two delicious flavors in one plant. But for Haley, even more importantly, this finding helps us rewrite the stories we tell about the people who were alive back then. It's easy to fall back on the idea that people were sort of caveman-like and, you know, they were just out to sort of eat as much and as um, often as they could because they never knew when their next meal was and things. But actually, I would say that they were extremely sophisticated and they had such sophisticated skills at acquiring food that they could sort of be really creative about the ways that they were combining foods. This is another thing that Rose and our Mesolithic friends have in common. Mad mustard pairing skills. I put it on everything. I mean, um, I'm a big carb person. So like any kind of bread product, it's good on. Olive bread with mustard is extremely delicious. I mean, obviously there are pretzels, but you can also put mustard powder on things like popcorn. So like a little bit of soy sauce and mustard powder on popcorn is delicious. I'd love to try that popcorn. But so I was wondering, you know, can you walk us over to your fridge? Tell us about how many jars you have and could you list some of the ones that you see? Yeah. All right. I will. I'll take you over. Hopefully my dog doesn't get too interested in what we're about to do. Okay, I'm opening the fridge. Let's see, where are we? So there's this great mustard place called, um, I'm going to mispronounce it, Mai, Mai, M-A-I-L-L-E. Uh-huh. Mai. 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 Okay, so we have a bunch of those. So I have a, a walnut mustard from them. Um, I have a Dijon black currant liqueur mustard from them, which is really good. It's like it tastes like Thanksgiving. Mm. Um, it's amazing. Um, really good on French fries, actually, because like they're sort of a good vehicle for any kind of mustard, but they taste like Thanksgiving French fries. Mm. Um, I have a, a blue cheese mustard, which is super strong. Um, you kind of have to like be a little gentle with this one. Um, we also have. A, an amber ale honey mustard from this farm up in Vermont that is near a place where we go skiing every year. Um, we, of course, have sort of the standard spicy brown 
for sort of hot dogs and on all that stuff. There's more, many more jars. The thing is, it's not just Rose that's crazy about mustard. Her partner Robert is too. It's actually central to their whole relationship, at least in terms of condiments. Um, we have a running joke because um, I subscribe to the Mustard Museum's uh, newsletter. Um, and it's sort of full of mustard information. And a couple of years ago, they sent one out that was like, you know, we do weddings, and I don't know if they were serious or not, but uh, we have a running joke about getting married at the Mustard Museum. Nikki, you and I did not have wedding plans because we're already work married. But we did actually visit the Mustard Museum. It's just outside Madison, Wisconsin, and we happened to be in town to do a gastropod live show. When in Madison, go see mustard, apparently. We're going down into the museum, the world's largest collection of mustards, mustard memorabilia, and fine mustard art. Barry Levinson is the founder and curator of the National Mustard Museum. He's a lawyer with a serious mustard obsession. We've got nearly 6,000 different mustards here. So in addition to American yellow mustard, classic French mustard, you have horseradish mustard, uh, you have whole grain mustards, we have hot pepper mustards, we have herb mustards, we have fruit and vegetable mustards, we have garlic mustards, we also have uh, spirit mustards, which would be mustards made with beer, with wine, uh, we have exotic mustards. The exotic mustard category can be anything from curry mustards to truffle mustards to mustards with uh, ginger, uh, right now, we're standing in front of some of the, the French mustards. But before things get even more insane, although personally, I think getting married at the Mustard Museum is already pretty insane, and having 6,000 jars of any condiment is definitely a warning sign, we need to back up. How did we get from garlic mustard seed stew to the condiment-filled jars we know and some of us love today? Before we clear your sinuses with some strong Dijon, we have a sponsor to tell you about. The Great Courses Plus is an excellent way to discover interesting information in virtually any field. History, science, language, music, photography, cooking, and much more. With The Great Courses Plus, you get unlimited access to over 9,000 lectures filled with fascinating insights from some of the world's leading professors and experts. And as one of our listeners, you can start enjoying The Great Courses Plus for free. Check out Food, a Cultural Culinary History. Food historian Ken Albala explains how the invention of agriculture was likely due to a warming climate. The animals our ancestors had hunted vanished into the previously frozen north, but the plants became more abundant. So humans gathered and stored the extra beans and seeds, and then they sprouted. The rest is history. You can enjoy a special free month trial to get you started with The Great Courses Plus, but this is only available for a limited time and only through our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash gastropod. Start your free month today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash gastropod. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash gastropod. To get to France, first we have to go back to ancient Egypt. We also know that the ancient Egyptians would chew mustard seeds along with their meats. And that would flavor it, but they would just take the seeds because mustard seeds themselves are inert. There's actually a chemical trick to mustard. So the glucosinolates in mustard seeds, they're slightly different compounds in black versus yellow versus brown mustard seeds, but they work the same way, which is that they react with a particular plant enzyme in the presence of cold water to produce that fiery essential oil of mustard. This multi-step trigger process is another way that the plant holds fire until the caterpillar actually crunches into it and sets off that reaction. It's only when combined with some liquid do, the, do they release their heat uh, and their pungencies. As a result, that's what uh, the Egyptians would do. They say, OK, have some meat and chew on some mustard seeds. Then the Romans decided to turn mustard into a sauce. We know that the Romans were using mustard seeds in some of their sauces, and it then migrated uh, into the Roman Empire, specifically into the area now known as Dijon, where the monks uh, were making pretty much what we know as mustard today back in the 12th and 13th centuries. The first reference to mustard in the Dijon archives occurs in 1336. It's a record of a whole cask of mustard being consumed at a banquet. So mustard was already a big deal. The first ordinance specifying how to make Dijon came at the end of that century. Basically, soak the seeds, crush the seeds, and then add vinegar to the paste. 
To go back to our chemistry for a minute, using an acidic liquid like vinegar puts a break on the reaction, which gives the resulting mustard a long-lasting slow burn, as opposed to the quick, pungent hit of mixing it with water. Dijon mustard got super popular in 1756. That's when a major mustard maker in Dijon changed his recipe from vinegar to verju. It's a juice made from unripe grapes, and it's not quite as acidic as vinegar. Today, if you buy Dijon mustard, it doesn't usually have verju, but the makers still try to make it taste like the recipe that made it famous. They'll often use a combination of white wine and vinegar. Technically, Dijon is supposed to only be made with either black mustard or brown mustard seeds. But basically, nobody uses black mustard commercially because the seed heads are so fragile that you have to harvest it by hand. 70 to 80 percent of the mustard seed exported to make condiments comes from industrial fields in Canada, which happens to be the world's mustard basket. And Barry says a lot of those mustard seeds go to France. France, of course, is known for mustard. The per capita consumption of mustard uh, in France is greater than any other country. Since the 1800s, Dijon has been found at tables throughout France. In my home country, though, we developed a rival, Tewkesbury mustard, which is mustard mixed with its close cousin horseradish for a little extra something-something. This mustard was sold and transported dry in balls known as Tewkesbury fireballs. They were a staple in English kitchens in the 1600s. Shakespeare loved mustard uh, and wrote about mustard in several of his plays. Shakespeare even used this famous Tewkesbury mustard in one of his slightly less famous plays, King Henry IV, Part II. He wrote, his wits as thick as Tewkesbury mustard. This is not a compliment. Barry has his own favorite Shakespearean mustard quote. What say you to a piece of beef and mustard? I, a dish I do love to feed upon. From Taming of the Shrew. Here's the Shakespeare mustard reference I found surprising, though. Eye of Newt, which is one of the things the witches stir into their cauldron in Macbeth, thigh of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, etc., etc. So Eye of Newt, I always thought that was the eye of a newt, but it isn't. It's an old name for a mustard seed. Rose, the rabbit holes you've sent us down. But Shakespeare's Tewkesbury isn't the most famous British mustard today. That would be Coleman's, the classic hot, just good, strong mustard that it just kind of uh, goes right up in the nose. Coleman's in the yellow tin, it's the British mustard. Yeah, Coleman's dry is kind of the gold standard. The thing about Coleman's is, as Barry points out, it was originally a dry mustard, and you can still buy it that way today. I have two tins of Coleman's mustard powder in my kitchen as we speak. But grinding and selling dry mustard as a powder that actually wasn't Jeremiah Coleman's idea. The inventor of powdered dry mustard is lost to history. The only record comes from an article published in 1807 in the Gentleman's Magazine. And the author wrote that in 1720, quote, it occurred to an old woman of the name of Clements, resident at Durham, to grind the seed in a mill and to pass the meal through various processes which are resorted to to make flour from wheat. Mrs. Clements's mustard flour was a huge hit. Even George I gave it the thumbs up. But she kept the secret to herself for many years. Jeremiah Coleman was originally a flour miller with a mill of his own. He didn't turn to mustard until nearly a hundred years after Ms. Clemens's big breakthrough. But then he conquered the British mustard market with a special blend of locally grown white and brown mustard seeds ground to a fine powder. Coleman's mustard was just dry mustard uh, for the first, say, 60 or 70 years before someone decided at Coleman's, well, why don't we actually make the, the mustard condiment? So while Dijon is made from brown mustard seeds, Coleman's is a blend of white mustard and brown mustard seeds. Brown seeds, like the ones used in Dijon mustard, they give you more of a horseradishy sinus hit. As opposed to the yellow seed, which is a little more pungent just on the tongue. So France has its favorite mustard, Dijon. England has Coleman's. But in America, it's all about French's. So what's that? That came about uh, a little over 100 years ago when, uh, when Mr. French decided that even though there were European mustards, they weren't all that popular. What this country needed was a brightly colored, happy mustard. And that's what French's mustard has been. Actually, French's mustard, it first came out at the turn of the last century. It was originally called French's Cream Salad brand. Not only was it bright yellow, because Mr. R.T. French added turmeric to the recipe, but it was also creamier and sweeter. And it was a huge, huge hit almost instantly in America. It is generally made with a yellow seed. So it is going to have a very different kind of flavor profile. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that when you go to the ballpark, 
Uh, I think it's, uh, you gotta have yellow mustard, at least on that first dog, because you hold up the hot dog, you know, and, and you see the blue sky, the green grass, the brown base paths, and there's just something about that yellow squiggle of mustard that makes life so worth living that day. Oh, Barry. People have strong feelings about mustard. It's very important, and it's an ancient seed that we've had forever. Madhur Jeffrey is an actress and food writer. She's probably the most famous writer of Indian cookbooks. She's the person whose cookbooks helped popularize Indian cooking at home in the West. We've been stuck in Europe and America so far this episode, but mustard is global. And India has its own serious long-term mustard thing going on. It's not a condiment-based relationship, but it's central to Indian cuisine. It's been amongst our two hot spices that originated in India. We started out thousands of years ago with mustard seed and black pepper. Those are native to the region. And those were the only spices we had that were hot. And chilies, of course, came much later. So for many centuries, they were even more important than they are today, but they're still very important today because one of the oils that we cook with, which is very important, uh, is mustard oil. Mustard seed, and even more importantly, mustard oil, is found in kitchens throughout the Indian subcontinent. It's used for cooking a lot of food in several states. Bengal cooks a lot with uh, mustard oil. Kashmir cooks a lot with mustard oil. So these are two states where it's almost the state oil. And there are certain dishes that would be cooked always with mustard oil. If you're steaming a fish, you will definitely use some mustard oil. In Bengal, if you are making this muri, which is puffed rice, you puffed it and then you want to dress it quickly with different things. You'll put, among other things, uh, mustard oil on it and have it for breakfast. So, but here's what's weird. Mustard oil is banned in the U.S. as a food. It has been since the 1990s. When I buy mustard seed oil, it says on top, used for external purposes only. People in India eat it and survive and nothing happens to them and they live long lives. We put it on babies, we, you know, but externally we put it on babies. But I keep reading it and ignoring it. It's just like what they used to say with coconut oil. Don't cook with coconut oil. And people go through fashions and suddenly now everybody's cooking with coconut oil as if it's the best thing in the world. You might think that maybe the U.S. government was afraid of those pungent, insect-fighting glucosinolates, but no. The FDA thinks the problem comes from a fatty acid that's found in the seed. Apparently, tests on rats show that in high doses, this particular fatty acid can cause heart lesions. But frankly, as Mater says, literally billions of people have been cooking with mustard seed oil for thousands of years. I wouldn't give it up, no. It is in a lot of things that I cook. I cook everything from all over India, and I use it all the time. For Madhur, the magic of mustard is in the way you can manipulate its heat. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde of both spices and oils. If you use it plain, it's quite pungent. So when we want that pungent flavor, we use it plain. But if you heat the oil or if you pop the mustard seeds, they turn sweet and nutty. So it depends on what we want. It can change its shape, as it were. So in India, cooks know that cooking heat tames the fieriness of mustard seeds and oil. But Barry says condiment makers can use other tools to manipulate that heat, too. Which seed you use, how much water, how much vinegar is going to be used. There are all kinds of ways that mustard makers are able to change the heat of the final product. In fact, Mustard is surprisingly nuanced. You think of it as this blast of heat on a sandwich, but depending on how you make it or how you pair it with food, mustard doesn't have to steal the show. It can fade into the background and just make everything else taste better. I never really had strong feelings about mustard one way or the other, unlike all of our guests this episode, but the bagel shop near me uses mustard butter on their bagel egg sandwich, and it's mind-blowing. So I started using a layer of mustard in my savory galettes. These are freeform pies, and it totally ups the game. Whole grain mustard smeared inside the pastry shell of a quiche before you add the filling. Un- real. And mustard powder is my secret ingredient in cheese straws. But Barry and Rose have taken this pairing game a little further. It's something that you can also use in brownies because it accentuates the flavor of chocolate. 
this is going to sound disgusting to a lot of people, but I think it's delicious. Um, a little bit of mustard on Oreos is extremely good. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. wait. So are we talking one. like French's here or what are you doing? <laughs> what, like what, how is that? Like you just sort of dip a double stuff Oreo into like a little bit of mustard and Dijon mustard. And what does that do for the Oreo? Well, cause the Oreos are, are so sweet, right? Like you've got the chocolate cookie and then you've got that like really saccharine middle chemical bit. Like, I don't know what it's made of, but it's not food, but it's, it's delicious white and part. I eat it anyway. The white part. Um, and so they're, they're so sweet um, that just a little bit of like spiciness or that little bit of um, like mustardy flavor is really a good foil to the Oreo. It's delicious. I know everyone listening is going to be like, you are a psychopath, but I love it. <laughs> I totally want to try this. It's really good. I might skip mustard Oreos, but I'm much more into Rose's most recent mustard revelation. I have been really into making bloody Marys recently and I put a little bit of mustard in my Bloody Mary mix. Wait, the spread or the powder? I, so I've been experimenting with both. Um, so I will put a little bit of powder in the ring, like the um, oh, the ring yes. you put on the, the glass. And then a <laughs> tiny bit of Dijon really in. Yeah, it's super good. You have to be careful because you can definitely overdo it <laughs> with mustard powder in particular. But I also put a little bit of Dijon in the actual sort of um, concoction, the tomato paste concoction that I use to, to make Bloody Mary. So you, you can, I'll make you Bloody Marys anytime. They're my favorite drink. So I'm really I'm into making so them. I'm so there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for today's episode because we have somewhere to be. There's a mustard Bloody Mary calling my name. Thanks this episode to Rose Eveleth. She's the host of a fascinating podcast called Flash Forward. It's all about possible and not so possible futures. She had a recent episode on a future where we're all telepathic and another scary and possible one about what happens if the census goes haywire. Thanks also to Patrick Edger of Michigan State University, Haley Saul of Western Sydney University, and Madhur Jaffrey, legendary food writer and actress. We have links to their work on our website, gastropod.com. And finally, thanks to Barry Levinson of the National Mustard Museum in Middleton, Wisconsin. We've got some more fascinating mustard stories involving mustard gas, mustard plasters, and mustard sounds saved for our special sustaining supporters newsletter. If you're able to donate $9 a month on our website or $5 per episode on Patreon, you too could enjoy some more mustardy goodness. Finally, spring is getting here, and that means spring cleaning is too. This year, try the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It works like magic. It cleans the tough stuff, sprays, and wipes can't like burnt on stains on the stovetop and that stubborn ring around the bathtub. Plus, it's so easy to use. Just wet, squeeze, and it's ready to erase. See what cleaning wonders it can do for your home by visiting mrclean.com slash podcast. We're back in two weeks with a few famous friends. Yep, we're hanging with Nigella and Yotam, and we're name dropping like we just don't care. But first, here's a listen to what you'll hear on the podcast 20,000 Hertz. Muzak gave us a lot more than just the genre of easy listening. Muzak introduced the idea that music was to occupy and influence public spaces. There's a lot of frankly spurious research which purports to show that we all love music everywhere. We don't. Unlike the easy listening of Muzak's heyday, music in public spaces today is often faster and louder. Restaurant reviewers who measure and list noise in their reviews are reporting levels above 70 and even 80 decibels. Those levels can cause hearing loss over time. 